Well, in the last uh, couple of weeks, Nathan and I have been speaking about the church. We've actually been talking to you about you. And uh, a month ago, I spoke on the topic, Church Marvel at Your Destiny, which is to fill the whole earth with the presence of God because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Nathan's uh, message last week was entitled, Be We, emphasizing our corporateness and moving in the opposite spirit of our age, which is expressive individualism, which is another way of talking about the ways of the flesh, utter selfishness. (laughs) Today, I intend to speak about the church once more, and I intend to speak against what I think are two of the greatest heresies of our time, namely that I can have Jesus without the church, And the church is man's idea, not God's. So who needs it? (laughs) Say, don't you think it's interesting that the book of Jude comes just before the book of Revelation? The book of Jude is about the great apostasy. And the book of Revelation is about the great apocalypse. Apostasy comes just before the apocalypse, the, the revealing of the Son of God in all of his glory. Well, we're not supposed to be against anything these days. (laughs) That's being politically correct. We're all supposed to be tolerable, tolerant and agreeable, but I I can't seem to get over this problem that I have of hating and opposing the lies and the deceptions of the devil. So uh, is that okay if I'm a little bit negative about that? I I think Jesus seems to have the same problem. (laughs) The Bible says the very reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So, you might be thinking to yourself, so why do I want to talk to you about these things? It's kind of like preaching to the choir. I mean, obviously, you're here. (laughs) You're expecting to encounter the Spirit of Christ in the body of Christ. You haven't left the church. And you're not trying to persuade others to leave it either. Well, two thoughts. First of all, we all have friends and family who have left the church. I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hands. I know it's the truth. And they're trying to persuade us that they've done the right thing. And some of them are trying to persuade us to join them. So we need to know how to respond, actually, speaking the truth in love. Secondly, People who are trying to have Jesus without the church actually watch a lot of videos on the internet, like this one. (laughs) So we welcome you (laughs) with love. (laughs) So we just might get lucky and reach our loved ones this way. I want to begin by, uh, by the way, I I had a whole slide presentation I put together this morning, and as I was saving it, the... uh, all but the first two slides suddenly disappeared. So if you want to be a Satanist and you don't know how to get in hold of the, uh, hold of the devil, I can, I can help you because he lives in my computer. <laughs> 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 Let's begin, let's begin by considering the only Greek word in the New Testament for church, which is ecclesia, from which we get the English cognate ecclesiastical and that sort of thing. This word contains within itself, the essential nature of the church. Ecclesia comes from two smaller Greek words, a preposition and a verb. The preposition ek means out of or out from, and the verb kaleo means to call. Therefore, we, the ecclesia, are the called out ones. Called out from what? Well, let's just borrow an image from the past. Like the church bell in an ancient village, calling us out of our homes, calling us out of our places of business, calling us from our places of leisure. To what? To worship? To pray? To celebrate? To grieve? Or to mourn, but to do it together? as one. The called out ones are 
the gathered ones. It would be helpful and very instructive to go through the entire Greek New Testament and translate every occurrence of ecclesia as simply the gathering. And so that's what I'm proposing to do today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. He addresses the letter to the gathering, to the gathering of God that is in Corinth. 1 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, to the church, that is, to the gathering of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What strange terminology. That's really crazy. Now just change the word order without changing the meaning. To the gathering in God of the Thessalonians. As people gathered into God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Really? This is not just about people getting together? Oh no, this is a God people meeting. Just meditate on the words of Jesus for a few years, this great mystery. I and the Father, and the Father in me, and I in you, and you in me. We are the gathered in God. And who does the gathering of us into God? Well, let's let the Scriptures speak. Psalm 147, verse 2. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. Isaiah 40, verse 11. He will attend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. Jeremiah 30, verse 10. He who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. Now the words of Jesus, Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not. You see, it's God himself who gathers. God is a gathering God. It's his nature to gather. Therefore, the gathering, the ecclesia, is God's idea not man's. He has many under-shepherds, like myself, but we're all just deputy gatherers. When you read the parables of Jesus, he uses many metaphor metaphors that all involve gathering. He gathers wheat. He compares the great harvest at the end of the age to that. He gathers sheep. And at the end, he gathers all nations before his throne. Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. You see, every gathering throughout history culminates in the great and the final gathering. And then there's this amazing passage from John chapter 11, verse 51. Caiaphas, being high priest that year, prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. I like that saying. It says Jesus is coming back for a bride, not a harem. That's God's plan for the end of time, the ultimate gathering of every tongue, tribe, and nation under heaven. 
Now, before we talk about why God gathers us, it's important to see in the Scriptures the great counter-gathering. At the very beginning of the church's prayer book, what is the church's prayer book? The book of Psalms. The book for prayer and worship for the church throughout the ages. At the very beginning of the church's prayer book, we, we, we first meet the man or the woman who's deeply rooted in God like a tree planted by a stream of water. Let me just read it. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. It's talking about the will of the Lord. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. <clears throat> the very next thing that we encounter is Psalm 2, which is the great counter-gathering. These are all of those who refuse to be gathered by God and to love him with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Why do the heathen rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth, the rich and the powerful, set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together. Some translations say they conspire. Is there conspiracy? People like to judge you if you're a conspiracy theorist. Well, I happen to know there is a conspiracy because it's in the book. But like it says in the book of Isaiah, don't call conspiracy what these people call conspiracy. The Lord will tell you what the conspiracy is. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. So in Psalm 1, we have the righteous man who delights in the word of the Lord and meditates on it day and night. And in Psalm 2, we have the counsel of godless men, literally a conspiracy of international leaders, the rulers of the earth, who see the will of God as nothing but bonding, bondage and restriction. And they say, let's get rid of all that. Let's break out of all of that. These are the architects of a godless society. This is the will of God versus the will of man. And this is the picture of our world today. So how do you stand as a righteous person within the context of a world system that is at war with God and his people? How do we stand on the sovereign word of the Lord against the unrighteous laws of of godless men. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about what those are, but they're coming fast and furious in our day. This is the environment in which we live that requires a gathering together of God's people. Because neither you nor I can stand alone in the face of this unholy contempt for God and his will. It's like sending a kid out to the store in the dark alone at night in a crime-infested neighborhood. The main feature of Psalm 2, however, is not the rich and the powerful that conspire against the Lord and against his anointed, who makes all the plans for our society that in the end never work. That's what it means for the heathen to imagine vain things. They're always figuring out new plans that never work. The main character in Psalm 2 is God himself who sits in the heaven and laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath 
and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, the holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. We hear those words again at the baptism of Jesus. Ask of me, and I will make the nations, that is, the Gentiles, the heathen, the godless, I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Now let's just pause here to worship and marvel at our God, first of all, who sees the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end, in whose eyes one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. These prophetic words were written 3,000 years ago. And a thousand years before the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. Just think of that. Just think of that. Now, the first time that God set his son on his holy hill, they crucified him. And they hung a sign over his head that says, This is the king. So there was no doubt about who was being crucified. He died and was buried. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Now, one day soon, and I hope very soon, he will return to that holy hill. And according to Zechariah 14, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is directly across the valley from the hill where he was crucified. And on that day, the day of the Lord, the Mount of Olives will split in two, half moving to the north and half moving to the south. And then in the words of the prophet Zechariah, then... Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him, the whole gathering. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. And on that day the Lord will be one and his name one. Now back to Psalm 2. This powerful word from Psalm 2 is, is so like God, who was and is and is to come. This word has been fulfilled. Both David and Jesus were the Lord's anointed. It is being fulfilled in this hour. We, the gathered, are the Lord's anointed, and it will be fulfilled. At the end, Jesus will return and gather all of us in everlasting victory was and is and is to come. This is more exciting than time travel. (laughs) We're already living in eternity. We've already transcended time. So this leads us to the final question, for what purpose? For what purpose does he gather us? Well, the reason for our gathering rests primarily in the heathen (laughs) who rage against us. God, how many of you know this is a principle? God uses adversity to get us to gather and seek his face. Because in truth, we desperately need both him and one another. Remember when Jesus... Uh, rather, when Peter confessed that Jesus said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the anointed Son, and Jesus said, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my ecclesia, I will build my gathering, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And where do we find ourselves gathered most of the time? At the gates of hell. Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe you have no trouble in your life. (laughs) 
First of all, he gathers us to host his presence. Bill Johnson wrote a book not too long ago entitled Hosting the Presence, Primary Function of the Gathering. He has anointed our gathering to be his dwelling place in the Spirit. And he tells us that in so many ways from the book of Psalms. The Lord is enthroned, where? On the praises of his people. In the Gospels, Jesus himself says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am. Every time it says I am, pay attention. The great I am is talking. Wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am. Where? In the midst of them. In the epistles, over and over again, you are the body of Christ. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So he gathers us to host his presence. Secondly, he gathers us to hear the prophetic word and against all odds to believe it until it comes to pass, to continue to stand on that word and then to join him in his laughter and derision. That's actually our primary warfare as believers is to believe, <laughs> In 1 John chapter 5, the apostle, John says, now this is the victory that overcomes the world. What? Even our faith, our faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world. All the heathen, everyone that rages against God, this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. And in the exercise of this world-overcoming faith, he gives us just one thing to do. Ask. Ask. Ask of me, and I will make the nations, the heathen, your heritage, and the, and the ends of the earth, your possession. You know what? It takes a lot of people gathered together over a long time period of time to win a battle like that. We're still at it. Still believing. Still asking. But we're getting close to the end, I think. I'm pretty sure. All the nations are beginning to totter. Would anyone like to disagree before we go on? All the nations are beginning to totter. The words imminent crash are in the news every day. Now that's bad, bad news for the ungodly who have put all their hope in this world, which is coming down. But the best news ever for those who have put all of their hope in the appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ to usher in the new heavens and the new earth. Does this seem like a trivial thing to you? That the primary function of this gathering, the ecclesia, is to hear and to believe his word and then to ask? I heard a quote from Eugene Peterson recently that really opened my eyes. It was about prayer. He said, prayer is political action for the public good. Prayer is political action for the public good. And then he said, asking is the national service of the gathered people. Asking is the national service of the gathered people. It was Billy Graham, quite a few years ago now, who said, this world would have collapsed long ago if it were not for the prayers of God's people. Because the gathered people of God are the only ones in the world who know enough to ask for the righteous rule of his son, Jesus Christ.
The fallen, lost, deceived world can only imagine foolish things that never work. Do you know that in World War II, particularly in Europe, the bombs were falling, people were dying, but when the church bells rang, people came out of their homes, out of their businesses, even out of the bars and taverns, and they gathered to seek the Lord and pray. Winston Churchill understood that prayer is political action for the public good. He understood that asking is the national service of the gathered people. And then there were the prophetic intercessors. I kind of think of them as the spiritual green berets led by the Welsh coal miner, Rhys Howells, who by divine direction prayed their way through several strategic battles of World War II that were won by manifest miracles from heaven. I've laid those battles out in fine detail in previous messages, so I'm not going to do that again today, but there were no freak coincidences. It was all divine intervention of the highest sort, things that could not be explained in any other way. So the scourge of Nazism was not defeated by the military might of the Allies. The scourge of Nazism was defeated by divine revelation, prayer, and overcoming faith. You see, God gathered his own army for war, and he did it his way. We cannot privatize faith. Pray in your closet every day for your personal things, for your family and friends, for your own needs, so that you know how to pray in the gathering for corporate things and national things and international things. All week long, I've had a picture in my mind of, of actually what it's like to pray with the gathered people of God. I saw this huge crescent wrench with a handle hundreds of feet long. I mean, this was a huge crescent wrench. And it was set on this massive nut and bolt that was about the size of a large house. Like a big, big, think big, 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 big. And it was unthinkable that one person could even hold the wrench in place, let alone loosen the nut, which is frozen in place. But then I saw this massive army of people all put their hands to the handle of this wrench and begin to push together with all of their might. And the frozen nut just began to budge just a little, but the people were greatly encouraged and let out a mighty roar and began pushing again. Have you ever had that kind of experience in corporate prayer? Like you feel like you're dealing with something that's utterly impossible, but yet you have some kind of a promise from God. And so together you set yourself to doing this thing. I had another picture, and it was of a vehicle stuck in deep snow. And the owner of the vehicle was just spinning the wheels and getting more and more deeply entrenched. And then a team of us came along and took over. The team leader, who was the most skilled driver of the bunch, sat behind the wheel, rolled down the windows, and shouted instructions to the rest when to push forward, when to push backward, as he skillfully rocked the vehicle back and forth, back and forth, until it finally escaped the icy pit and came free. I've been in prayer meetings like that. No single person knew how to pray over a seemingly impossible issue. You just kind of sit there in silence and you're thinking in your head, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. 
It's like trying to get a grip on something that's really, really slippery. And then finally, one person would kind of get just an inkling of how to start. And then the rest would agree, amen, amen, <laughs> keep going. And then someone else in the group would get further revelation about how to carry on. When we used to spend time doing quite a bit of deliverance in, in groups and stuff like that, we would have these kind of experiences. Once again, the rest of the group would kind of add their muscle just by agreeing in prayer, amen, amen. And sometimes we would pray through a whole issue like that. And there are other times we would pray as much as we knew how, and then we would leave the rest until another day. But we knew that we were engaged in a battle of faith. But without the gathering, that kind of praying can't be done at all. Remember Acts chapter 12? Who prayed for Peter in prison? The whole church. The whole church. And it seemed like such an impossible thing that when he finally gets out of prison, he appears at the door, they don't even believe it. Some things, even many things, are so big and so tough that it requires the whole church to gather as one, with one heart and with one mind, to come into the agreement of faith and to do the impossible. But that's our task. That's what we're here for. To hear the word, believe it, and then ask. Well, I hope you took a few notes today. If the enemy's been tempting you to leave the church, I hope you think again. <laughs> and if you have friends or family that are in that place, you might want to share your notes. Or you might want to send them a link to this message <laughs> on our website or on YouTube. And here's my personal plea. Forsake not the gathering. God is the gatherer. Gathering is God's idea, not man's. And if you've left us, please come back. Because we need you. And you need us. Amen?